Come on, let's stand as we go to the Lord in prayer. Happy New Year. Praise the Lord. I hope it's off to a great start with you. Amen. Let's bow our heads as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you again and again for getting us through this last year of 2018. Thank you for all of the, I'm sorry, 2019. Thank you for a wonderful congregation that corrects me when I'm wrong. But Father, thank you for the last year, all the lessons that we learned along the way, the challenges to our faith, but also the opportunity to see you in new and profound ways, to get to know you in a deeper way. This year ahead is a year of vision, and we want to make sure that whatever vision you stir in our hearts, that we know that it's a part of a greater vision that you have for us. So Lord, continue to stir our faith, our boldness, to imagine you in ways we never imagined, to dream big dreams, pray big prayers, because we serve a big God. So Lord, bless us as we launch out into the deep this year and let our nets down, knowing that we're going to pull in a catch that we never imagined we'll be able to pull in. We bless you, we love you today, Lord, and we thank you for all of the good things ahead. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Come on, three people, bless them in the name of the Lord. So Mark chapter 6, verse 7, Mark 6, 7, Jesus is about to send out the 12 apostles. I remember there was one case where he sent out the 70. Right? He spoke to crowds of 500, and there were multitudes that could not be numbered. But here he calls the 12, and he sends them out. They're going to preach. They're going to teach. They're going to lay hands on the sick, watch them recover. So he's sending them out on a mission to represent him. The interesting thing is what he does with them right up front. So let's go to the text. And he called the 12 and began to send them out two by two. What did he do? It's not on my face. <laughs> on the screen or in your device or in your Bible, what did he do? Right up front, out the gate. He called the 12 and began to send them out two by two. Right. But then what did he do? What did he give them? Authority, Authority over the... Hmm. Why would he do that? Why would he do something like that? I mean, they've got a great message to preach, right? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The things that were spoken of to Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, it is a time of its fulfillment. Messiah is here to usher in an age of peace and justice, fairness, 
God's love, God's life, God's light is now present in the earth. Emmanuel, God with us. And he sends them out. And he gives them authority over unclean spirits. I think it changed the way they looked at the world. I think it brought to their attention that although they had a great message, although they were going to be doing good, would you think healing people is good? Yes. Delivering people is good? Although they have a great message and were going to do good things, one of the most important things they needed to be aware of is that, is that there would be forces in opposition to all the good that they were about to do. Why do you think that's important? And of course, this is the benefit of sitting in the front. You get to answer questions. Of course he's coming. Of course he's coming your way. Why do you think that's important? Camera's on you now. Oh, how important is that? Is it important? I mean, the Holy Spirit records it in the text so that we would have it, so that we would know how it went down, right? Am I giving you a pass? I'll be back. <laughs> Is it something that they needed? Yes. Not only to exercise, but also to be aware of. Suppose he did not tell them, and they went out, and they ran into that kind of opposition. Do you think it would have challenged their faith? You think it would have made them wonder, well, are we doing the right thing? Are we doing things wrong? What's going on here? Do you think they would go through a whole process of trying to figure out why they're not experiencing the kind of success or why they're experiencing the kind of pushback that they're getting, I will tell you, Christians can act quite naive. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, and if you know the scripture at all, and you're still surprised when forces come against you while you're trying to do good and be good, you're naive. Turn your neighbor and say, he's talking about somebody you know. <laughs> the Apostle Paul says that we are ambassadors of Christ. The moment we become Christians, now we become the property of God, the temple of God. His Holy Spirit indwells us, right? And we become his representatives. In the West, we're evolving into a secularized view of Scripture. And the secularized view of Scripture actually takes out of it the supernatural. So if we were to read that text with a modern lens, we would take unclean spirits and translate that into a concept of evil. We translate it into a symbol of evil, but not real evil spirits. Because we don't want to talk about that. And yet you go to other parts of the world, right? You go to other parts of the world. Guess what you find? People are very aware, very conscious that there is another realm of reality. Yeah. 
And let's put it this way. God is spirit. This universe is a vast universe. So why wouldn't it be plausible that there are other beings, highly intelligent beings, that occupy a higher realm of reality? How many convinced that this is not the only reality? You can't believe in God without believing in another reality because God exists in another reality, a higher reality than ours. Amen? Amen? Which means that those beings who occupy that higher reality have to be highly intelligent beings. In fact, quite powerful beings compared to us. Are we reasonable here? Yeah. So, how many, you may not know personally, but you know of a human being who is highly intelligent, very talented, well-connected, and wicked? Morally compromised in position of influence. Oh, wait, I'm not talking about any specific person here. <laughs> Y'all chill out. I know who he's talking about. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. If you can have good human beings and bad human beings who are free will beings, in this reality, can you have bad and good beings in a higher reality? I will tell you, a human being with smarts, intelligence, talent, influence, power, well-connected, who's wicked, is a dangerous person. Can you imagine a divine being Highly intelligent, smart, talented, well-connected, influential, and yet wicked. Can you imagine? So the Bible presents to us two realities. One that is visible to us and one that is invisible to us. The Bible also presents that these two realities are connected in that one influences the other. So in Jesus sending out these 12 apostles and he's giving them authority, he is preparing them. He is equipping them for the other reality that they're going to face yes. when they try to help people. You see, there's personal evil, which is individual, in the choices that we make. the morality and standards that we may reject. There is structural, collective, institutional evil, which is expressed in governments, institutions, around the world, right? 
But then there's also spiritual evil. And it's spiritual evil that undergirds all the other evils. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. So he wanted his disciples to be equipped and aware for what they could not see, but they definitely would be dealing with. How about us? Does God want us equipped and prepared for what we cannot see and yet we'll be dealing with? You see, how, how many believe that there are fallen, morally compromised spiritual beings? How many believe that? How many believe that they are at work in this world? See, because there's some things that you just cannot explain psychologically or politically. There's only a biblical explanation for it. Especially when things happen en masse. The prophetic is predictive to the future. By the way, the prophetic is not fortune telling. So you don't go to the prophet and say, am I going to meet my husband next week? (laughs) The prophetic is predictive to the future, but primarily analytical to the present. So the prophets would look at the nation that they were in and those that surrounded them. And they would analyze and evaluate the spiritual, moral conditions. The political conditions. And they would get a word from God and then speak it into that culture and that society. In hopes that the eyes of that society would be open to the spiritual activity that's going on behind the scenes that is creating the culture, that is influencing and shaping the culture. Got it? Very important. So we, as believers, with our eyes open, know that as we look at the world around us, when we look at America, we look at what's going on in the Middle East, when we look at what's going on in Asia, all over the place, we know that it's not just politicians at work, bankers at work. It's interesting to me that we have an assassination of an Iranian general and that occupies a 24-hour news cycle. And then in the next 24 hours news cycle, we are examining the price of oil. Are you all with me here? What does oil? Stay tuned the next time you're at the pump. So things that are being done behind the scenes are pushing different agendas. And Jesus' disciples would encounter these things, and so would we as his disciples. It would be foolish of us as believers to think that the only intervention that the realm of spiritual beings makes in human history and human culture are people rolling around on the floor foaming at the mouth. There are very real, extraordinary things that take place. I've witnessed them. I've been involved with them, exercised authority over them, but they are not primarily 
how these forces work. Because it's obvious or should be obvious if someone's rolling around on the floor foaming at the mouth, something ain't right here. You don't need deep and profound discernment. But when you're dealing with the individual who's in a three-piece suit, looking sharp, clean, respectable, highly educated, and making decisions that will affect millions of people, now you really understand what's going on behind the scenes. And that's exactly how the believer should see the world. We should not be distracted by all the stuff, by all the noise. We should be able to cut through it and say, okay, what's behind that? Well, you know, pastor, that's all that political stuff. What? You better start asking it about your family and your relationships. What's behind that? Someone asked, well, how do we know the presence of darkness? How do we know the activity of evil? I'm glad you asked. (laughs) See, because I don't care what vision you outline for 2020, there are going to be some forces at work. to push back against that vision. And it's not so much that they don't like you, they don't like your Jesus. And don't think you can disconnect yourself from your Christian identity while you do your little thing over here. How you know the operations. How many of you in here were in the spiritual warfare class? Just raise your hand. Okay, good. I got some seasoned folks in here. You're, you're ready for this conversation. You know the operations of the enemy. You know what I'm talking about when I say the enemy? By some of the names that are given to him. See, with us, we name things very casually. Or we try to find, if we're a Christian believer, we have a child, you know, man, let's give him a biblical name. So we go through the Bible and find a name, and then we put that on the kid for the rest of his life. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Giving your child a, a, a biblical name doesn't, influence how they turn out. If we just name him Jebediah. (laughs) Let's think about him going to school. Jebediah. All those names you skip over when you're reading the Bible. But we know things about our adversary through the names that are ascribed to him. One of the names that Jesus calls him in John 8, 44 is a murderer. Murderer. It is a Greek Anthropophnos, which means man slayer. Is that a hint or what? Yeah. Gotta understand that malevolent spirits do not like human beings. 
And that's why anyone that engages in witchcraft or necromancy and thinking that they're somehow getting into a good relationship. How do you have a benevolent relationship with a malevolent spirit? That's an oxymoron. And I don't have to tell you who's oxy. He's called a liar. He's called the accuser. He's called devil, diabolos. But he's also called a murderer. And Jesus said in John 8, 44, he said he was a murderer from the beginning. See, that doesn't speak of someone who, who just wants to uh, uh, attack an individual. This speaks of someone who has a history of coming after human beings. You know, back in the, in, in, we come from three decades, maybe four decades, of a lot of the prosperity gospel and health and wealth gospels and things like that. And one of the key texts were John 10.10. 10. You all familiar with John 10.10, 10, right? The thief comes to steal. You know, oh, that one, pastor. Yeah, that one. The thief comes to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Let me dig a little deeper into that. You know what it means to steal. But the word kill there in the Greek means to slaughter without purpose. I'm going to try that one more time. The word kill there in the Greek means what? Come on, talk back to me. Yeah. To kill without a reason to kill. That's a dangerous spirit. And remember, it's not about just the individual, but it's the collective influence of a spirit like that. We have a term that comes out of the 20th century, the last 100 years. It's called mass shootings. Are you familiar with the term? It's happening in elementary schools with little children. And it's happening in open air concerts where someone just decides that they're going to slaughter innocent people that they don't even know. And it happens again and again and again. I, okay, well, let me finish. So the word kill means what? Slaughter without purpose, right? Just to kill at random without any reasonable, logical explanation. Pastor Karen likes to watch these forensic file shows. Yeah, she was making me nervous the way she watched those shows. <laughs> it's all about people getting murdered, I'm saying. I said, what's up with that? She says. I said, explain to me. <laughs> so she said, I like to see them get caught. Because nobody gets away with anything. But then she said, what puzzles me is, why didn't he just leave her? Why did he have to kill her? And where are we when we think that suicide or murder is the resolution to a problem? Where are we as a society? Especially when it begins to happen over and over and over again. 
I'll tell you what concerns me is the desensitization of our society where it becomes normalized. And we simply say, oh, another shooting. It infiltrated the safe spaces of our children. And now it's infiltrating the sacred spaces of our beliefs. So I want to elevate your consciousness so that you don't see Satan just as this individual who wants to steal your joy. Don't let the devil take your joy. Hallelujah. I want you to see him at work influencing society in ways that come back and affect you. So to kill means what again? Slaughter. Without purpose. The word destroy in the Greek, and you can look it up if you get a chance. It means to put an end to entirely. To ruin. To render useless. Now, I hope you're taking that and applying it to yourself. Because what I'm saying is, he wants you to be useless. And I will tell you, other than the rolling around and foaming at the mouth, the more subtle ways of the intervention of malevolent spirits into this realm of our humanity is to simply make suggestions in such a way that you think it's your own idea. So if I can suggest that you take yourself out and you don't recognize it's coming from an external source, you think it's you and then, to be, and then you begin to reason why you shouldn't be here. Got to understand the subtlety of all this. So through suggestion, insinuation, and of course he's called an accuser, so he'll hurl an accusation at you, and then you'll do some self-soul searching and agree with him. And agreement becomes a place of power against you. And convince you that you are your biggest problem. So if he devalues you, then it's easy for you to accept the removal of you. And no matter what you think of yourself, the value that you have in God's eyes never changes. He still sees you in a way that he's willing to die on a cross just for you. So no matter what you think of yourself, because these forces are at work. Your value in the eyes of God never changes, no matter what you do. As though you could do something that will surprise him. So very subtly, they suggest something to you. And it's so quiet, so sneaky, that you think you thought of it. I forget, I was was visiting. And we were, we'd gone hiking and I was at the edge of this, this plateau looking over and there was a cliff going down rocks down there beautiful sight 
But dangerous if you got other things in your mind. That's right. That's right. Can I share this with you? Yes. My secrets? Yes. I'm standing there enjoying the beauty of the, the, of the ocean, hitting up against the rock and the foam, and all of a sudden I heard, jump off. See, but I, 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 I have a level of spiritual maturity. I ask, why? <laughs> if we're going to talk, let's talk. Why? <laughs> so you see, then we aren't going to talk. <laughs> why? Why would I do that? See, but if you don't understand that this is an external source, you think it's internally you, and you start going through a reason about, oh, maybe I'm feeling to end my life. Maybe I, I maybe. Insinuation. And not only does it happen on an individual basis, it happens collectively to societies through one individual in a position of, of power. And see, what I'm concerned about, what I'm watching, it trends, trends as things develop over time. Do you know the 20th century was the bloodiest century in human history? Let me give you some statistics. Because remember, Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life. So if Satan is a murderer, he comes that you might have I'm going to try that one more time. i got to make sure it sinks in. Jesus said, I'm come that you might have what? Life. Exactly. So whatever God does enhances life. Doesn't diminish life. It enhances life. And whatever the devil does, he diminishes life. Takes away from life and brings what? Death. And what is death? The cessation of life. He'll bring death to your finances. Oh, wait, 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 wait. How many understand death to your finances puts you in a place of poverty, despair? Why do you think the devil is called the desolate one? Do you know what it means to make desolate? It means to ruin you and leave you empty, barren, and dry, and hopeless. So he brings death. And God brings what? I am come that you might have what? How many are convinced of that? How many, are, how many of you are convinced that Jesus came to give you life? If you're convinced of it, if you're convinced of it, then you will reject anything that is offered to you, suggested to you, brought your way, laid at your feet. That speaks of death. Jesus came for you to live. Jesus came for you to live. I, I, I'm trying to get. Jesus came for you to live, to experience life and experience it more what? Abundantly. Any notion of giving up, throwing in the towel, despair, and hopelessness does not come from Jesus. Fear, doubt. Listen, I'll say it again. Benevolent spirits lead you towards faith, hope, love. Malevolent spirits lead you 
to doubt, fear, and narcissism. You've got to know the difference. He's a murderer. That means he's about what? Death. Darkness. Fear. Anxiety. Distrust. And why does he stir those emotions? Because when we make decisions, and this is scientifically proven, no matter how much reasoning we go through, at the end of the day, we make decisions based on intuition and feelings. After you gather all the information, you ask yourself, how do I feel about this? Come on, isn't it true? And that's why you could have information that's solid and valid, and yet something inside you says, I don't feel right about this. Because that's how we were designed. Remember, we were placed in time, but we were designed and created for eternity. So there are things about us that are transcendent of time. And that's why nothing in time can satisfy us. Because we weren't designed for time and space. We were designed for eternity. And those things that are eternal leave a lasting impression on you. All right, let's talk. How many have ever done something, said something, experienced something, and it was pleasurable, it was joyful, it was a great experience at the moment, but a year later, You look back at what you said, what you did, what you experienced, and you say to yourself, you know what? I don't feel good about that as I did then. Do you know why? Because what you said, what you did, what you experienced was temporary. But then on the other side, you have said things, done things, experienced things that 10 years later, you look back, you still get uplifted by it, thinking about it, reflecting on it. You still feel good about it. It charges you. It inspires you. That was eternal. We're just taking a closer look. And I think we need to. In the last hundred years in America, we've gone from two mass shootings in the 1920s, that decade, to 37 mass shootings in the 2000s. Mass shootings. And we're not even talking about war. We're talking about mass killings. I was referring, looking back, In the early part of the 20th century, 1.5 million Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, in 1915-1916 were slaughtered. 800,000 Tutsis and moderate Hutus in Rwanda in 1994 were slaughtered. Are you hearing me? Washington Post in July of 1994 reviewed the, the, the Hitler and reviewed individuals like Mao Zedong. And those of you who are young, you know, Mao Zedong? Communist China. Millions of Christians slaughtered and killed. Hitler is now blamed for 12 million concentration camp deaths and at least 30 million other deaths associated with World War II, while Stalin is believed responsible for between 30 million and 40 million unnatural deaths, including millions from a famine that he created. Mao Zedong in communist China while most scholars are reluctant to to put out numbers, all right, but the best evidence shows that he is responsible for at least 40 million deaths and perhaps 80 million more indirectly, which includes deaths that were the result of disastrous policies that he refused to change. Mass killings in Rwanda, mass killings in Cambodia, Darfur, southern Sudan, mass shootings in America. From 1973 to the present, in America, 
60 million babies were aborted. Globally, from 1980 to now, 1.5 billion babies were aborted. Now, that's not to condemn anyone in here. If a circumstance and situation presented to you that puts you in that very, very tough scenario, it's not to condemn you. But what it is, is to express that in the last hundred years, we've moved decidedly from a culture of life to a culture of death. It's interesting, in Genesis chapter 6, it says, and the earth was filled with violence. And the imaginations of men's heart were evil continually. These are patterns. These are movements. And let me say this to you. We didn't even add up those millions that I just shared with you in just a hundred year span. We cannot say that it's just political, just psychological. There's got to be something more going on. And that's why we are blessed to have eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to understand. So we look at the news differently. Because we know that there are forces at work fashioning and shaping what's going on in human society. <sighs> this is not to make you paranoid. Because here's the good news. Jesus, through his cross, death, and resurrection conquered all principalities, powers, rulers, thrones, dominions. And according to Colossians 2.15, made a public, open, disgraceful show of their defeat. And then he says to you and I, in 2020, go, preach, teach, heal, and I give you authority. You know what it is to have a key to a lock that opens a door and the key is sitting in your pocket and you're standing outside the locked door screaming and complaining and blaming everybody? <laughs> he told Peter, upon this rock I'm going to build my church. I give you the keys of the kingdom. What is the kingdom of God? It's righteousness, joy, peace, power, made real and tangible by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Faith unlocks the kingdom's power. And the reason the children of Israel failed in the wilderness, because they would not mix what they heard with faith. And as a result, they failed to enter the promised land. Vision is your picture of a preferred future. There is a future that the devil prefers for you. 
Which future are you going to choose? What will it take before we believe the Word of God? Stand up and begin to operate in faith, embracing all that God has for us. When does it begin? Right now. Right now. You don't go out without being equipped. God won't send you without equipping you. But it's up to you to trust that equipment, believing that equipment, use that equipment. And he began by giving them authority over the spiritual forces. Which means that if you can check the spiritual forces, it frees you to deal with the mess they created. I'm going to try that one more time. If you can check the spiritual forces, you can now deal with the mess that they created. God gave you the authority. You now have to roll away the stone. You now have to engage the mess. I got to stop here, but did you get anything out of this today? Only thing missing behind me is a fireplace. So I hope you appreciate this fireside chat. We're going to have more of them because I want you guys sharp. I want the demonic realm to see you coming and say, ah. Is that all right with you? Now, think about this. When he sent those men out, they had no seminary training. They didn't have any special degrees. They didn't have any power and influence. They didn't have any position. You want me to go down the list of what they didn't have? Because the devil will get you to focus on what you don't. And I'm trying to get you to focus on what you do have. And what do you have? I come in the name that is above every name. A name that every knee, am I preaching here this morning, must bow and every tongue confess his authority. Come on, let's all stand. I hear a song in my mind, this means war. Yeah. Pastor, Pastor, why are you ruffling the feathers here? Why are you rocking the boat? Why are you starting the war? The war's been on since Genesis 3.15. You were born into it. God just pulled you off of the enemy's side and put you on the right side. Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Our faith. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, may we rise up. May we be stirred by the Prince of Life. May we seize with depth in our hearts the authority that you've placed in our lives. May we rise up as a mighty army in this 21st century. Instruments in your hands 
to bring light to the darkness. Life with his death. Hope with his hopelessness and despair. Love. Use us. We ask you in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Come on, slap high five with three people. Tell them I got that word. Listen, nuclear weapons, all of the tension, this is death that we're dealing with globally. Death of relationships. I thought it was interesting that all the reports you hear over the last 10 years is how many people are leaving church. It makes sense that the devil will try to get them out of the place where they're going to be nurtured and their eyes are going to be open and they're going to be given authority and understanding it makes sense because then he could do what he wants with the society and they'll be blinded to it this is the place this is the source this is where we need to be amen come on let's give God a good hand clap offering for his word today if you were blessed father thank you for this incredible spiritual family. Let us be just that, a spiritual force. Father, help us get our house in order so we're not distracted. And we can be a sharpened instrument in your hands. We ask you and we thank you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. And amen. Come on, let's say something good as leave this place, but never God's presence. Jesus is Lord, period. We believe it, we proclaim it, and we're seeing it come to pass. God bless you. I love you, family. Have a wonderful week in the Lord.